This episode may contain strong language and adult themes. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. As the day is dawning on a Vegas Monday morning, how I long to be there because Phil is waiting for me there. I know, I don't get it. Phil who waits for me. You guys got to let me in on a whole bunch of your stupid English uh, humor. <laughs> don't don't lump us all in with his shit. Okay, mate. I'm not How are we all tonight? Are we good? Mm-hmm. What's Christopher? What? Neither. Have a look. It's from Is a little breaking? country league game of the weekend. Well, I've never seen that in before. I hope he's getting tea right. back. Well, that, I'd say that's a little bit worse than uh, Marla Allen win, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, <I'm full> there, <laughs> <isn't>? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, you heard it here eight, first. Eight weeks he's got. Eight week ban for that. Eight week ban. Right? Okay. Who, the, the thing is on that though, who do we ban? Do we ban the guy doing the groping or the guy doing the teabagging? Well, this is the question. It is. It's a very important question. It's one that Super Rugby has not considered. Hey, you heard it here first, guys. Not Super Rugby. First, oh, well, that's the surprise. Over Rugby. in Vegas. The fuck are they talking about? Uh, listen, nobody knows what the fuck we talk about any time. We don't so, know. Phil, we're coming, we're coming straight to you for the live weather report. How's oh. the weather in Vegas? It's oh, here hot. we go. It's hot. Hey, up. He's cute. It's, it's so hot. damn hot. I saw this guy in an orange robe, first in the flames. You know what hot is in? That is not a... <laughs> I take it there's no clouds today, then, mate. No, no, no clouds. Just all smoke. I had my dog out at the park at 3.30 this morning. That would be 11, what, almost noon your guys' time. And it was 93 degrees. So what's that, 30, 35 degrees centigrade at uh, 3.30 in the morning. The good news is... No wonder you get up early. Could you it imagine sleeping through 33 degrees? It wasn't sunny. I couldn't sleep through 22 degrees when it was the other mate, night. Mate, I was sweating my bollocks off. I had my fan on like full blast. I had my window all the way open. You've just created an image in my head that I do not want. You sleeping hot with your window open and your fan on with your bollocks out there sweating. <laughs> it's not an image I want in my head. Come I mean, here now and take it away. Take that image away from me. I Tom, mean, you bathed me for the first, you bathe me through the first two, three years of my life, so I'm pretty sure I can't get more traumatising than that. Mate, you were re- you were a retard. We had to bathe you for a lot longer than that. Fuck oh. off. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom, take this image of Christopher's little dingling being powdered out of my head. <laughs> Tom, talk some rugby, man. Yes. Yes, Please. rugby is finally back. Oh, Premiership rugby, I should say, is finally back. Thank the Lord. Um, and an interesting weekend across the board. Obviously, no crowds. Um, players sort of accustoming themselves to all of that sort of stuff. Um, and some interesting little bits as well. Um, obviously, the Mighty Quins um, getting a decent win against a strong sale on Friday night. Um, oh, and then... They couldn't catch the fucking coronavirus. Never mind a ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, should be a strong sale. Should be. A, it was obviously the uh, the dominance that Quinn's provided. They were like it was non-existent. Last... All of Faf's bloody passes were going to feet, and you're claiming it was the greatest win since fucking sliced bread. No, <laughs> not having it. <laughs> not having it. Just saying, guys. Again, Welcome bring, everybody bring, bring, to bring. the Tom, the Tom and Chris show. <laughs> Hey, Tom, Tom, I just want to give you a heads up here. I'm going to give a warning out to Chris. He needs to back off that 0.0 Heineken. Get yes. yes. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on the 0.0. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Oh. Yeah, you can tell oh, this is for his beer in a few weeks, can't you? That explains it. <laughs> Tom. Yes. My without friend. interruption from Christopher, talk yes. to us about this mighty... I hate, just because it's in the song... 
Okay, you don't have to call the mighty twins all the time. Oh, wow. man. It'd be rude not to, I think. Oh, man. <laughs> And Chris knows all about that song as well when he was crying his eyes out at the Wasp defeat about four years ago. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so um, some, some good rugby this weekend. Uh, our first post-quarantine red card as well and a first red card for um, Mr. Christoph Ridley as well. But it was um, one that can't be argued with, really. Straight to the head, shoulder, can we, no real can, attempt. Can we just talk about the angle that his shoulder was at? He literally went in with his arm down here, his other arm up here, and he just smacked him in the head with that one. I think he, I think he watched before he went onto the pitch. I think he watched Owen Farrell and decided I can do that a bit better and make it even more obvious. <laughs> so I definitely get sent off. The thing is, Faz looks like he's making an attempt to rap. That's why he gets away with it. This one is just no bang. He probably <laughs> wants the rest of the season off. <laughs> he wants to go on holiday. I was enjoying that lockdown crap. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? Before you like explain that, I thought Christopher was just doing some new break dance move then. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. The He'll be in the bars of Benidorm in September. <laughs> yeah, he's like a shit sprinkler, isn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, now, talking to Christoph Ridley, um, I have to say, uh, you could hear a lot more over the ref mic this weekend than, than perhaps we mm. normally can. Talking to Christoph, um, now, I don't know whether you saw his game uh, with uh, Gloucester and Worcester at the weekend. Now, there's a lot of refs who had some chat back at the, uh, in their games. Uh, Luke had it, um, Carl had it a little bit yesterday. But I don't know whether it was just frustration with those teams for whatever reason or whether they thought, well, Christoph's a young lad, let's, uh, let's get into him a bit. But that's how it felt. And the actors talked to the captains and players a number of times. Both sides, let me referee it. Please keep that down. No, let's cut the back chat out. Guys, listen, I, you, know, you may have had 20 weeks off, but... The people that will watch this are the ones that everybody else has to referee on a, on a Saturday and a Sunday. And it will filter down through the amateur game all the way down to the kids. And they'll think it's acceptable to behave like that. So, because I know all you Premiership players watch our show, here's an appeal from us. Please, please set a better example than that. Yeah, I actually have a, 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 a different look at this. And we know that it's not normally accepted in back chat to a referee or even you could tell by the I think by the types of conversations and the repetitiveness I think that there's a, a bit of frustration that's built up by the players by the lockdown I you know whether it's the coaching that said hey you know what we need to get out there and get rid of some of this frustration uh but I I think there's actually a bit of so sociology to this and psychology that needs to be you know just vetted out and just let it play by week. But I agree with you along the game. Uh, but I think is after week one, we're done. Yeah. I think that perhaps we, we heard it a bit more anyway, because there's no crowd. So you're hearing, I mean, obviously they've got the special effects in the background of the crowd, but still you're hearing the game a lot more. Um, you know, you see talk about Christoph's game. I think you heard Christoph talk a lot more as well. Um, and it was really interesting to actually see as a referee to see it a lot more clearer. But I think, again, without that, sort of crowd in the background um, and taken over that the main noise you're hearing the players a lot more um, so maybe it is something that happens a lot more anyway and we just don't hear it it's well, while we're on the subject of referees Woody Woody this is for you man what the hell is the going on with that beard did you see Ant Woodthorpe <laughs> running the line yesterday oh, it's Sunday. Oh, Mate, what's he trying yeah, what's he trying to do? Hamish has shaved this off. What did I'm he do? Take, take it off I'm and glue it onto Woody's face? He carried off Hamish's hair and he's gone, ah, you dickhead. He shaved his <laughs> off. Um, so, Woody, Woody, seriously, mate, we love you, but the, the beard ain't suiting you, man. I was going to say, on, on yesterday's game, you know, which was a million times better than the game that we all had to endure on Friday night. <laughs> um, what are we thinking of uh, Fecky Towers? Yellow card, boys. The, the high tackle. Remind me. The high, I haven't seen the game. The one that so rode, the the rode up. So, so, to be fair, well, it, it, Thomas, the time, it, you're it, a perfect person. I'm actually going to work, just saying. You're, you're on a, a Sunday. person to give your opinion because you didn't see it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like just like the crowd and most of the players on the pitch. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll make my judgment based on who the referee was. Carl Dixon. <laughs> Oh, well, boy, oh, I don't know then. No, I'm now, sure. you, Bearing in mind his next Quinn, did he handle it well, even though you've not seen it? <laughs> uh, I, I've, I, I, I couldn't possibly pass judgment on that. Is this why you didn't yes, come on a couple of weeks ago when Carl was on? <laughs> uh, no, that, well, I didn't even know he was on until afterwards. <laughs> Do you know what, and, mate? <laughs> Actually, until about five o'clock on the front on the Monday night, I don't know who's on the show most weeks. <laughs> <laughs> This is anyway, unscripted. Uh, this is unscripted. No, we Yellow tried cards. to script on week one. Have you seen I mean, if someone scripted this, then they need to fucking sack him. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow cards, Michael, what we're saying. Do, do, do you agree right. with the decision? So, when, the, when we finally got to the TMO, because Hughesy did say uh, he looked at it unofficially and thought it was okay. There was an awful lot of complaints from the players. Um, and to, to be fair, Carl was... Um, was saying, I, well, he's already had a look at it. And then I think it popped up on the big screen and he saw it and said, OK, I think we need to formally review this. I mean, can um, I just say, in my time, it was a fucking huge hit. Like, oh, even, yeah. with crowd, even with crowding, that would have echoed around the stadium. Oh, my. He, even if he went through him. Yeah, even if he <laughs> yeah, if, even if, even if wasn't just landing from a catch um, and the timing wasn't absolutely barb on, if he was just running and he'd hit him like that, it would still have taken him back several metres. It if was a damn big hit. If he hit. Him lower, if he'd have dipped a little bit more, it would have been the best tackle I've ever seen. Be the best tackle of this season so far. <laughs> 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 but bear in mind, we're only four games in. <laughs> um, but, but no, it was a big hit. And I think one of the things is, he, he, went, he led with the shoulder and the arm, which is absolutely fine. Uh, it is quite high. It's just on the shoulder. But it hit him so hard that it spun... The, uh, the catcher round yeah, so, and as so it spun I, him his other arm has come up and caught him so it's he, slow, but it's come up very quickly and hit him in the, in the thing, I've, got, I've got a different perspective to you so I think his shoulders hit his chest and gone up but his arm was always high for me so his arm was always above the shoulder if you look, if you look on the really slow motions it, 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 that arm I think hit, the trailing arm hits here and comes straight up because mm. as he's being spun as well, there's nothing to grab onto, so it goes up and out of the way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, th I think you know the what. The, hey, listen, um, it was according to the protocols, it was it was a high tackle. Uh, was there a degree of danger? There was, yes. Um, was there a high degree of danger? I think it was moderate. Um, it started low. It started legal, but came up very very quickly, which is why the danger was increased. Um, and event. I think I think the yellow card was the right decision. But I tell you yeah. what, didn't he, didn't Fakatau have a wonderful game? That yeah, guy was, lights, lights up game. the back line. All game. He was in yeah. in, in defence. He's an absolute unit. He yeah, there's before no we run out of time, yeah, going through it. Sorry, Chris. Before What's we that? get run out of time, um, and, and we run out of more Fakatau brotherly love with Chris. Um, let's. We, we did touch on that red card. Um, so let's let's just go into it a little bit more, Tom. Yeah. So um, the the red card, as I say, it was just a, it, it was blatant, straight in shoulder to the head, um, and it seemed like a very clear process with the TMO. Um, I think Christoph handles it really, really well. Um, obviously, you know, a big moment for him. Really, his first red card in the Premiership, um, and the first red card back. Um, since lockdown so yeah but well, I think it was the right decision um, and um, the, the, the Worcester player apologised on Twitter later that evening to Johnny May and others um, so you know it, hopefully um, everyone was fine afterwards um, and uh, yeah we'll just um, fingers crossed everyone's all right and we'll see what the disciplinary says see if he gets his holiday or not. What's the, uh, the over-under on it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say eight weeks <laughs> okay, we're going, to, we're going to have a sweepstake. I'm going to say... Yeah, I'm in Vegas. I'm in Vegas. I'm... Having, watched it, having watched it, it's on the five-metre line. It's a very high degree of danger. I would, I would tend to go to ten. Yeah, I, I'm I mean... I'm saying there's going to be a bit, a bit of mitigation, a bit of maybe good behaviour stuff thrown in. He'll get six weeks. That's he why changed, I went with... He changed, 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 he changed,
above 10 or below, really. I, I don't want to sandwich myself in the middle. That's why I took eight. <laughs> I, knew, I know what the number is going to be. Sorry. <laughs> I, think <it's, laughs> I, think <it's, laughs> I think it's much more likely to be sort of around eight, eight to 10 weeks, probably, because, yeah, he's mitig maybe mitigation. He apologised. He was very good about it. But end of the day, it was still... You know, there was no no real arm involved. Very clear shoulder to the head. So there was nothing particularly to mitigate it. You could say Johnny May dropped a little bit, but hardly at all, really. Not enough to warrant any major mitigation. So, yeah, I, I'd say sort of around eight to ten weeks, I think. It right. did look bad, I've got to say. Well, Even at full speed the first time I saw him look bad. It was tremendous. I'm surprised Christoph didn't catch it first time, to be honest. Well, that was a nasty, nasty. It was a double. It was a double tackle as well, wasn't it? So I think it was, was it? I think Christoph was the other side. Yes. Yeah, yeah, or there, there was, was somebody coming from the other side. I don't think he had much of an impact, but he kind of was was there and part of it. I think that's. The um, side yeah, and was, and I've just I've just watched it again, and he was the other side from Christoph as well. So fair enough. Yeah. So I think that, okay. that after that, yeah. um, listen. Before we um, before we execute him <laughs> without a trial, um, and uh, before we go to the break, um, Phil, quick minute, you you've had an interesting phone call um, this week, haven't you? Yeah, we had uh, with Major League Rugby coming on. People know that Jonathan Kaplan and Chris Pollock are going to be leading up the referee uh, allocations and development for the uh, Major League Rugby for the upcoming season so they've already started putting some of their plans together and uh, back 10 pros had a discussion with Jonathan Kaplan on Friday uh, looking at ways to help build local development and um, trying to assess things going forward in education and training and also probably looking at trying to uh, evaluate potential uh, people with supporting mechanisms and varying roles. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, we'll have another follow-up probably in a few weeks' time, but it's it's interesting that they're already started working on this stuff. I talked to a couple of our referees this morning, in fact, just prior to this call, uh, they've already sent out the letter of intent to some of the referees who've been involved in, in previous years' MLR to see if they're interested in what roles they want to take on going into 2021. So two boys who are at university, if you want to go and study in the States, <laughs> there's roles over there for you. Make sure you're near one of the 13 franchises. I have a rumor on one of those franchises. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what, because you can't stay on for the full call tonight, um, we're going to come to your rumor um, straight after the break. But it is time now to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with you right after this. When you need clear and concise match official communication systems, look no further than the brand new AxiWe AT350. Radios are always that they're always useful, they always help us, especially AxiWe's where all three of us can be open at any time, we can have open communication. Available now from refcomsglobal.net. Invest in profits into match official development worldwide. Welcome back to part two of the 22 dropouts, your most favourite off-season, on-season, mid-season, end-of-season and beginning-of-season podcast and YouTube show. We do not take a break like all the others. We bring you all the latest up-to-date news, uh, all the reviews, all the rumours. And if you think we do any of that, then you're as stupid as we are, because all we do is talk shit all night, which is great <laughs> because it keeps us all in giggles. And, um, and that's all we want to do. We want to have fun and we want you to have fun too. So don't forget, check us out on our social media sites. Just search at 22 Dropouts on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Um, you probably won't find much on there because these lazy wankers never update it anyway for me. Uh, now, before the break, we were talking to Phil over in Vegas. Uh, about uh, his wonderful call with uh, with the guys from the MLR and how they're going to be supporting them. But Phil has got to go today because he has a very important meeting, which you can tell because he's wearing a proper shirt this week. Um, yes. So, uh, Phil, before you have to head off, and we will just wave to you when you tell us to, um, we want to know what your rumour is this week, man. So, actually, I have two rumours. And he both... Uh, yeah, well... Kelsey, you get what you pay for. Christ, I've got to pay for this. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so the rumor is that Chicago is looking at an MLR franchise, probably 2022 season. I don't think it's going to materialize by 2021. And that gets to the second part of it is, is that there's, there's discussions on whether Hawaii can get their franchise and all their finances and everything together uh, prior to the beginning of the 2021 season as well. There's still a chance that that may happen. It, and if it does happen, there's a good chance that they may be playing some of their matches, let's say, in Las Vegas. Because Las Vegas is also known as the Ninth Island. There's a very large Hawaiian and Polynesian community based in, the, in Las Vegas and the region. So with, with Chicago looking at coming on, that could push it to 14 teams. And, you know, we've already had a discussion on potentially Miami being another franchise location. Canada's looking at one on the West Coast in Vancouver. And then there's also the possibility of one being in uh, the Midwest around the St. Louis Heart of America, they call it. Well, I tell you what, that's going to be one hell of a, uh, a season to watch and to be part of. And um, I really hope that Hawaii can get their, get their stuff sorted, ready for the beginning of the 21 season. That'll be, that'll be awesome if they can. You know, they, got, they got some big backers. They got some big names a part of it. If, you know, if they're going to be able to pull it off, there's a lot, obviously, of additional costs by getting there and hosting. And, you know, you got to keep in mind this uncertainty in travel with the COVID situation. Hawaii still has a three-day mandatory test, a negative test prior to entering the island, or a 14-day quarantine. Now, 14 days in Hawaii is not so bad, but you got to stay in your room. So why would you go to the expense? <laughs> well, yeah, there is that. I mean, you can stay in Las Vegas with the window shut and the air con on and watch the, the smoke out your window. Now, um, and I'm just... I had a pop-up on my screen from my wife sitting in the other room telling me what she wants on the shopping list for tomorrow morning, which is what took my mind off things for a minute. But before, uh, before I so read easily, the shopping list... I didn't realise you're so easily distracted. Hang on, let me show you. <laughs> <laughs> now, before I read my shopping list, uh, we are going to say hello to two new folk tonight. Uh, one's slightly new and one's uh, not so new. Um, so welcome back, Lawrence, um, who has managed to get some time off tonight and uh, is cycled all the way home. Hopefully it wasn't eight hours like it was last week. Um, <laughs> us. And uh, at the top, we've got uh, from deepest, very, very darkest uh, Surrey, we've got Chris Will Do, um, otherwise known as Chris Davies. Um, so, Lawrence, let's come to you first. How's your week been, man? How's, and how's rugby over there? Uh, my week has been fine, uh, really trying a lot of farming here and there. Uh, not much rugby still in Kenya because uh, apart from athletics, no other sport has actually gone back to its uh, normal ways. Uh, not, not much um, hairdressing going on over there either, mate, is there? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it will not go over. <laughs> mate, I thought I had a crap ball it, but I'm, I'm looking a lot better now. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we'll come back to you in a bit, mate. Um, Chris, Chris with no yes. lights. Uh, obviously, obviously minimalist. Oh, are you about to get bombed by your daughter? Uh, by my son, actually. Oh, there bring him in. <laughs> Hello. There's my son. Hi. Wave to the there camera. You You're on Wave television. Hello. There you go. We're going to make you famous. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we said you're on television, he went from. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you know, yeah. Chris, 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 I don't know you. But I'm going to guess he got a good look from his mom. I don't, he got all his good looks, yeah, from his mom. And uh, it's, probably, it's probably the most laughs you love for your jokes as well. So there you go. And there you go. <laughs> now, there's a man who has watched the show before. You can tell. Um, <laughs> although, mate, he's, he's definitely got the hairstyle. Yeah, he has, yeah. So uh, that's my, uh, my first and uh, only uh, son. Uh, uh, and before you say, I do know that he is my son. Um, and uh, he's uh, two and a half. Um, Nothing like that crossed our minds. I know. And uh, he's two and a half. So, um, yeah, it uh, explains uh, part of the journey, really, uh, why I uh, came back uh, to England. Uh, my wife's uh, 
from Gloucestershire originally in sound system stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's part of the story of my journey as well. So, yeah. Right, tell us a bit about your journey then, because it's, it's been quite a big one over the last few years. Yeah, um, I, I started off, I guess, um, if we go way, way back, um, sort of 2004 after qualifying as a teacher and pre that I was in the military for four odd years. Uh, just like most kids, we seem to be online here right now, a bit of career advice for you. Um, you know, you go to the Army's careers office and you uh, sort of get lost. And then four years later, bang, boom. Um, yeah, did a couple of tours uh, in the military and then um, actually realised what I wanted to do. And that was like going to teaching, um, sports science, coaching, all those sort of streams um, and following that. Uh, ended up at Hartbury in Gloucestershire uh, for a number of years, uh, working with uh, the academy you there in Gloucester. You can't have everything, mate. You can't have everything. No, you can't have everything. And then uh, moved on to London Moss for a little spell. And then that started sort of the journey with our family um, overseas. Uh, my wife had the opportunity to take up in Dubai in about 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, I was there for a few years with uh, Abu Dhabi Harlequins as a DOR. Then that took me across to Hong Kong. Uh, that then took me on to Fiji Sevens, and boom, there you go, in a, in a nutshell. So um, basically, you thought you'd be a teacher because it was going to be easy. Realised you could go uh, uh, around the world, <laughs> and then realised that actually rugby was far more fun. Fuck the teaching off and just, just, just stick with rugby. Uh, words to that effect, yeah. Um, so yeah, now that sort of takes me back into full cycle, now back into education, uh, where I head up the programme here uh, down in Surrey, in Gordon School. And um, and pleasing thing is, we just signed a contract now with the Harlequins to be the first um, team, not this season, but the season after. I don't think this one's going to even go ahead. Anyway, who knows? We'll, I'm sure that'll come up a few times. Um, but um, uh, as part of the academy with the uh, Quinn, so that, that it's gone full cycle, really. Oh, that's right. That's huge. Uh, now, what we are interested in is your little coaching bit on the side as well, mate. <laughs> All right. Uh, is this, uh, I guess, uh, what you mentioned early on about opportunity to plug a bit? But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess uh, it's, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while, and that's. I guess I've been out of the country for a wee while as well and tax purposes as well. It's important to uh, make sure everything is uh, in, in order. Um, so, uh, and and HMRC, of... Tom, Tom, doesn't your yeah. father work for HMRC? He, yeah. he, he doesn't, no. No, no. Oh, he, right. he, he, <laughs> no, it used to be customs next size, that was right. Uh, yeah. Thank fuck for that. Um, so, um, <laughs> so basically I uh, set up a, a, a small, well, basically a skills and consultancy uh, small company even over covid and some people think you're nuts doing that yeah and uh, what i'll be doing in the future is uh, looking to do um, mentoring coaching skills on a consultancy basis which i've done in the past as well so dubai non-tax hong kong little tax fiji didn't get paid bit of tax there you go um and things like that you know but i did get paid eventually but yeah uh, now I've got a really important question for you. You've spent yeah. all this year, all these years. Now, obviously, you're from you're from Wales, aren't you? You can yeah, tell yeah. by the accent. Yeah, you give it away. Um, you now, you've spent all these years. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's perfect. All these years. All these years. Yeah. yeah. All these years. Um, yeah. Well, I'll put the subtitles for the for the Americans in the room a bit later on. Yeah, you're welcome, Phil. Uh, <laughs> so you've been, you've been away and you built up a really good town while you're there. Now, I know you've, you've moved to the south of England, renowned for having half decent weather. But um, how long before you think you'll go back to your normal milk bottle white self? I'm, I'm not like most uh, Varley commandos uh, from West Wales that uh, go under sunbeds and stuff, if that's what you're thinking. So, no, nah, no. Nah, I, I think it's... Uh, it's an all natural and this ambient light I got you yeah, um, sort of gets it off. <laughs> I was going to say that's why strategically keep the light dark. Yeah, that's right, Phil. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, Chris, I got a quick question for you, though, if you don't yeah, mind. Phil. Uh, you, know, you, know, you mentioned you started your business because of you know, tax purpose and everything else, but that's not true. It really, it's about your passion, your interest, yeah. right, and really putting something together. And I'm one of these people who look at things out of 
out of crisis, there's opportunity. And the COVID is a crisis that we all know. But let's talk about a little bit about your opportunity and, you know, what, what, what the heart is in, in putting the business plan together and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, it, it's something that's just been in my mind for quite some time. And I, I guess um, it's quite like a niche market, I think, Phil. You know, I, I, I've also got like a, a good analysis background as well. And it's very rare that you get a lot of uh, what people regard as like sort of computer geeks behind the, behind the computer that have a good eye or quality eye for the game as well. No disrespect to people that are involved in the industry at the moment as far as rugby analysis is concerned. They are getting far better, don't get me wrong, but that's a small percentage. Not many of those guys then go onto the pitch and then be able to transfer and work one-to-one -one with players and, and have those sort of relationships on a, on a, on a sort of coach delivery level as well. So... I guess um, it, it's something that's been in my mind a while. And, yeah, it, it, I'm very passionate about it as well, in, in particular around developing individuals. Because for me, my, my philosophy is around like, developing the individual. And despite the fact we think this great game that we all love is about team, it is, don't get me wrong, there is always room for individuals within that. And there's always individuals within the game anyway. Um, that we need to fit within that jigsaw. And I, I think it's a part of the game that we do neglect quite a lot. In particular in 15s as well, where, um, you know, you have large squads. Uh, you look at even MLR, you know, like maybe San Diego, for example, which I, I know a fair, a reasonable amount about MLR. And the squad sizes are getting larger and larger. So managing those, I think, is going to become far more difficult. and become a bit of a shock for those that aren't used to that as well. Um, most of the coaches that are there are highly experienced. But in 15s, you have such a diverse of characters, you know, and that's just off-pitch stuff that, you know, it, it, it's difficult to develop those individuals. And I always think that there's a market for that, it, you know, in a, in a long sort of winded way around that. <clears throat> that's very similar to our MO under the back 10 pros under us developing the professional match officials and uh, ultimately is about trying to improve performance and relationships. Yeah. I noticed you had uh, Chris Paul uh, potentially coming out and doing um, some work out there. I've been he is. fortunate. He's already, on. He's already on board. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is great, which is great. And I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work with Chris uh, when he was down in uh, Fiji. I was with the twenties at the time and, he would come in and advise us as coaches as well. Some real quality conversations, you know, and he has a great eye for the game as well. So that's going to be fantastic for the league um, and for the coaches as well, you know, and you'd be a bit stupid as a coach if you, despite the fact it's very much a cat and mouse game, isn't it? You know, uh, between referee, coaches and so forth, you'd be stupid not to tap into that knowledge and build those relationships. Um, because ultimately, you know, you guys would be in charge of the game. And despite the laws, you know, we're looking at interpretation in Super Rugby, aren't we? For me, breakdown law has always been the bloody same. I don't know all this song and dance is about, like, oh, it's changed. It fucking hasn't. It hasn't. It's a sevens breakdown, in my eyes. So um, I hope that makes a bit of sense. And uh, as you can tell, I'm quite passionate about what I do as well and uh, maybe I do go off on tangents but apologies so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just uh, want to ask so obviously you know you've you, you've coached a variety of sort of ages from senior by down yeah. to now you said you're back at school how do you find tailoring the difference between coaching adult rugby and coaching youth rugby um it's quite a broad one, isn't it? It's a, quite a broad question there, Chris. I think uh, the best way to sum it up really is like keep things very simple no matter what age group you're working with uh, and understand um, in terms of where that individual is along in their journey or where that team are in their journey. I mean, it's such a broad question, mate. You know, um, I, th I think it's just keep things simple be clear in your instructions and building those relationships is, is vital, you know, and essentially you'll end up with a, with a good outcome from that, if that makes sense. 
with you. With you. Now, now we are going to have to say goodbye now. <laughs> no, no, it's just because we, we're going to have to that say goodbye means, to Phil. Yeah. Phil has got a really important meeting to, uh, to to go for to now. So, Phil, um, just before you go, one quick plug for your very favourite drink, and then you can send Stephen um, a, a bill. Uh, go on, cameras on you, man. The choice of the younger, newer generation: Diet Pepsi, <laughs> Pepsi Max for you. Wow. Thinkers. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Yeah, you safe. take care, Phil. We'll Thank speak you, soon. Anyway. Take care. See yeah. you next Thanks, week, Phil. mate. Bye-bye. Cheers, well. Yeah, Chris, I just sort of wanted to, obviously, um, you know, I'm involved in coaching so well. What, what sort of started your coaching journey? How did you really break in to make it, sort of turning it from, you know, volunteering, as a lot of us do anyway, and turning it into a career, really? Yeah, um, Tom, like absolute loads of volunteering, mate. Like, I remember that's the start of it, isn't it? You know, and I remember like being crazy, being involved in like uh, county stuff, progressing on to, uh, you know, like 20s as well as a club assistant, and moving on and doing school stuff, college stuff, ending up at one stage. I remember pre that sort of that period between 2005 and 2009, coaching like under 20s at Hartbury as well, um, and then doing a national two team, um, England colleges, so that's four teams there, and then jumping in and helping in various other mechanisms as well, like camps and things like that. So like building up experience that way, um, and I think, it's about being patient as well. Like, that's so crucial. Um, you know, even even I can be impatient, you know, as far as, like, career advance, advancement is and stuff. But, like, your time will come as well, and it's just important to appreciate that journey and keep mm -hmm. on learning throughout it as well. Um, and I would say the patience aspect is, is that, you know, everyone thinks, all right, uh, you know, you, you've done, your, say, your level three, for example, and that gives you every outright to maybe coach at National League. It does, and it's about building the experiences around that. And then gradually, you know, you know those awards, despite the fact that, you know, they're brilliant for advancement and your learning and things, um, things will come in time, and what's meant to be will meant to be, you know, and right place, right time. Um, getting your name out there, knowing the right people, and just being a good person um, yeah. or a good bastard, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, to to people and having those relationships is key because you know if you're willing to work hard, willing to reflect on what you're doing, you know you you're going to achieve, and everyone is able to achieve as well, and that's really really important. I yeah, think what you're definitely. saying, Tom, is your social life is fucked for about five years if you want to actually get a real job <laughs> in rugby. My, my, my social no life is already rugby. fucked. <laughs> I, I, yeah, the, you know, I've, oh, it's oh, already fucked for coaching and refereeing. On, on that already. note, you've got to make you've got to make sacrifices, you know, and yeah, like 100%. my 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 boy that you just saw there with a the big hair, Billy. Um, you know, um, at the point in time. I share this with you guys, and it's, it's genuine. You know, you you know what the World Series is like, not just as a player, but as a coach, it's very ruthless as well, or any form of management. Um, we, I went on the World Series, and then, you know, what you would regard as most probably for everyone, and including myself, like a dream job. Um, and then, you know, next thing you know, even though it was all planned, don't get me wrong, like son <laughs> is, you know, my wife is pregnant and it's like, well, this isn't conducive for family life, you know, and you have to make sacrifices. And for the five months, and this is where the sacrifice is major, is like I ended up not seeing my, my son after two weeks of birth and then I had a jet back to Fiji. Then we went to um, like Canada and all the, you know, the second part of the sort of year. Um, and then that's in the World Cup year as well as, Commonwealth Games year um, and you know all those weddings and engagements and parties and all that stuff that I've missed yeah it's a lot you know and there's no coach out there that you, wouldn't be the you same you just missed the piss ups mate 
That's what yeah. it is. You miss the yeah, piss up. Piss up. Uh, so, Lawrence, <laughs> yes. while we're talking about coaching, Lawrence, how's your application going to be one of Kenya's uh, sevens coaches? <laughs> Probably just before you go to that, um, I've got a question for Chris. Probably how his background as a teacher or a sports scientist sort of has uh, sort of helped him uh, in his coaching career. Yeah, um, first thing is, is like planning and um, again, relationships and being able to communicate with people, um, being able to understand people um, is quite crucial a part of that as well. Um, and uh, just systematic way around planning things and um, understanding stages of learning, how people learn. I, I mean, the list is endless. It's been very useful. Um, and I'm not a theorist at all either. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about like theories around learning and things like that. It's just, it, it gives you that sort of gut feeling as to, you know, where you should be going with things as well uh does that sort of ans answer that for you yeah pre pretty well answered and just yeah. to inform you if you haven't applied for the kenya sevens job coach um <laughs> what's interesting around that and what's interesting around that and like around part of the journey as well going back to like tom's question about sacrifices and stuff um i was working like this is a long way around about saying it, but it does make sense. I was working in Hong Kong rugby and we were like starting off the elite rugby program as it's now known, um, ready for World Cup qualification. I I've been down to Kenya quite a few times and we played Kenya in like two tests and stuff like that. So as part of that team and, and things. And um, as part of that journey as well, a, a good way of learning, Tom, like if or any of us on this call or anyone that listens, is like observation. What has teaching taught you? Going back to that question as well, is like how to observe and pick up some good things as well. Part of Hong Kong journey as well was I was an LO one time for Kenya Sevens. Kenya Sevens, when Paul True was in charge, I was there LO. And I think Paul understood that I also wanted to look at it from a, a, a coaching perspective as well. So I got to know those guys really closely and I also um, observed them a lot. So for two years of that like four-year journey there, I was there LO and I, I observed a lot and like took a lot of notes and things and got my own spin on things. Um, and yeah, so I have a good affiliation with Kenya as well. And uh, no, I, I have applied in the past. Could have been 2017, but maybe a bit 2018. Oh, that's yeah. Benjamin Naimba. Naimba, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was just like it was quite an interesting, interesting sort of scenario. And we all know like bits and bobs around Kenya Sevens and stuff like that. And it got so much, uh, and <laughs> so much potential though. Unbelievable amount of potential as a country to achieve and I, I think it's just important that there's a lot of other matters that are sort of dealt with too. Lawrence, while we're talking about Kenya Sevens, um, do you still have a Sevens team over in Kenya, mate? Uh, yes, it's, it's, still, it's still there, although not much uh, of uh, rugby going on now. Uh, most of the sports personalities have actually jumped into other, other jobs because it's not really sustainable for like the past uh, five or six months as it has been all over the world, but probably a terrible situation for Kenya sports, sports personalities. Mate, you just ruined my fucking joke. <laughs> what I was hoping you were going to say, I'm going to keep this lot in now because it was actually quite a good answer. I was going to say, have you still got a sevens team in Kenya? You're supposed to say, yes, we have. So right now, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Get the cameras ready now. Here we go. Here we go. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. So, Lawrence, um, have you still got a sevens program in Kenya? Yes. Well, you're doing a fucking better job than the RFU is. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you see how much better that would have been if we'd have done that Bye. the first? 
Talk about drop the mic, whoosh. I do, really. <laughs> so, um, Chris, have you, have you been over to uh, the Safari 7s before? Um, no, I haven't been to Safari 7s. I've heard uh, great things about it. Um, and um, it, it's, it's somewhere possibly... I got a couple of other things going on in terms of uh, like sort of trying to build a, uh, another invitational team, obviously in light of what things have gone on of late. I think that's potentially the way things are going. I'm sure we'll talk about that at some stage. I am I'm absolutely certain that you will want to join our series coming in a couple of years called the Pro 7 series, in which we travel all around the world, not as country teams, but just Pro teams. Yeah, 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 Semi correct. Pro teams. Yeah, yeah course, and I course think... You will. Um, yeah. Now, it must nearly be time for another break, because Christopher, as you can see now, has gone on his, uh, his second wee-wee. Um, but before, <laughs> before we do... Um, you could be wanking, we... man. <laughs> no increase. No increase. You know, we thought that's what it was doing between part one and part two. <laughs> we'll erase that bit, by the way. We're in part two with the shit. The pressure on the is appreciating. All right. Chris, have you really not ever watched this show before? A um, little bit, yeah. I've only a little bit, a little so you bit. know we're yeah. not going to take that out, don't you? No, I know that, I know that, but we can, uh, <laughs> we, we can't obviously put that on any form of educational... Uh, no, 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 we will, we will give you the raw footage to edit how you want, but um, yes, the, yeah. our, our show is definitely not for the under-18s. Yeah. Um, yeah, now, we are going to uh, take a quick break now, but uh, once we come back from the break, we are going to talk to Chris about uh, some of his time with Fiji. Um, there's uh, been a lot of discussion about that over the last six months or so, if not a bit longer. Um, certain people have been in the media uh, a lot talking about how, uh, how the guys over there really, really struggle and how world rugby and the rugby world uh, should be supporting people like that. Um, and I agree. Uh, so we'll, we'll take, get Chris's take on that after the break, which sounds really, really serious. And then we're going to ask him the really, really, really difficult questions like, the best place he's ever been on a night out. Uh, so we'll see you right after this. to part three of uh, the 22 dropouts your favorite youtube show and podcast. we're no one favorite let's join ourselves here we're no one favorite hands up if this podcast and show is your favorite obviously there you go <laughs> two there's two of us see three oh look it's... oh, oh. oh our ratings have just gone up <laughs> now, other podcasts are available, um, but we wouldn't recommend them. Uh, just like other drinks are, ava are available, but we, uh, when Phil's here, we only recommend Pepsi. <laughs> Before the break, uh, Chris was telling us about his, his journey, and I, I do um, want to dig into a little bit more of that, in particular his time with Fiji 7s. So, um, 
Now, that must have been quite tough, Chris. So I'm going to ask you the, the hard ones first. Um, on the World Series, your best ever night out. Ian, oh, sorry about the night. <laughs> it sounds like I'm on a night out already. It sounds like I'm on a night out already. Um, but... Yeah, Chris is just coming from the back room of a pub. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, oh, so um, I just got the bonus on the slots. <laughs> yeah. Ding, 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 ding. As as management, and this is uh, honest truth. Like we we um, just always believed in like next job, move on, because there was a lot of things that we had to get on with. You can imagine organising and, and things like that. So probably are a you nice. Seriously, are you telling me? No, no, me no. That... Wait for it. Wait for it. Ah, okay. For it. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say there's always that last night before you jump on the flight to the next one. Yeah. Um. Probably the uh, second time that we won Hong Kong Sevens. Obviously, it was a great night as well because, like, for Gareth and I, it was like returning back to like where we previously worked as well. Uh, in particular, Gareth was head coach, obviously, of Hong Kong Sevens as well. So, like, to go back there and win on your sort of home turf and the, and the home of Rugby Sevens is just, you know, unbelievable. And uh, it, it was pretty pretty calm but like carnage and it's all right as well a uh, lot <laughs> lot of bit sunk and but like definitely you know like quite a quite a small group of people in a special moment um without a doubt you know so yeah that 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 really stands out for me as uh, probably mine after that you know it was literally next job because we had to fly on with the same squad of the com game so and we were the only team may i add that like took the same side as a, a respect to Hong Kong Sevens and the World Series in that year. Everyone else, you know, um, South Africa um, turned up with um, a young side as well. They kept their big guns as such for the Com Games and we, we, we just took out our same team and we played Kenya in the final, actually, um, which was a great final. You know, we had to go on and do next job. So a lot of the time, we, you know, we were hard working. Uh, as well, I know there are teams that love love a good night out as well. So uh, yeah, and, you know, it's part of it. Yeah, yeah, we we know them. They're called the Army Rugby Sevens at the moment, and they love a good yeah. night out too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Now, uh, you you hinted earlier in what one of the things that you said that um, you um, you didn't base yourself out in Fiji. You said about how you would then leave your wife and, and son and go off for five months. So how did that work for you? Um, yeah, it was a lot of like ping-ponging around and working out where our next legs were and just trying to come back and forth. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was just a lot of travel. I mean, I, I remember um, going with the under-20s Fiji to uh, play New Zealand and Australia and Tonga in the Oceania under-20s and then fly in from there to Suva to then LA and then back to UK maybe for a couple of days and then moving on and going on to the next leg. So that's a good example of like one of the, one of the longest trips I've ever had. And it, it was just about coping with jet lag and keep on sort of on top of things really on a personal level. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, as a family, we understood exactly what, you know, what the ultimate objective was really. And, um, yeah, it was just about having that understanding, you know, in particular from my outstanding wife. And people always go on about the medals, trophies or whatever it may be. And the, the significant others are the most important part of it. You know, uh, if you've got like the support at home, you know, you, you can go on to do things. So, yeah, that's really important. So I, I take it then from, from what you said, the family was UK based at that point. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the family's UK based, but we still had a place out in Hong Kong. You know, you get into all these contractual things with flats and things. So we had that, and that that was uh, obviously nice to sort of visit in between when we could as well. But um, yeah, the the family was based in the UK, so I, you know, like London Sevens, I I came out earlier as part of an advance party, so you know, sort of sorting things out. And that's where Gareth was outstanding with me and understanding, you know, and he's an uh, unbelievable family man as well himself. So he, he gets it. And obviously Fijians understand about family in particular as well. So it's important that those things are in place. With, with your time in Fiji, obviously because of your job, you weren't out there all the time. 
how how did you find things there and how did you find things were for their what are their stars their professional players i i think um just a part of your question there you know just to correct that a little bit is that i was there a lot um okay. i mean yeah yeah i was there a lot and, and i would only um sort of fit in to sort of travel around as much as I could, you know, like come to London a little bit earlier, as I alluded to, and then Paris, and then come back after Paris in that little mini sort of gap, and then, you know, not have many days in the UK. So I was, I was in Fiji a lot, and uh, it was all, you know, training and focus upon, like, talent ID and things like that whilst I was there as well. So... um Answering to your question around conditions and things around training, I mean, as far as like support networks, as far as S and C knowledge, uh, coaching, etc. You know, it, it it's world class. Um, as far as like conditions in terms of like sort of training facility, it has improved significantly since I was there last. What, what was it like? Just over two years ago, but um, at the time, it wasn't world class at all. Um, however, still being able to produce world-class players, I think comes through the dedication, hard work, obviously of the players, and then the support networks that they have around them as well. Um, so that you know, as well as if you want to look at it far more deeply around, everyone always thinks, "Oh, why are Fijians so skillful, etc." It's, it's a deep learning um, as far as when they were kids. Uh, they play everywhere and anywhere. There's been a lot spoken. Uh, you know, Ben Ryan during this uh, this last season has been on on podcasts and shows before, mm. and he's talked about the, the difficulties uh, for the the players. And um, you know, I think you touched upon it earlier, didn't you, about the not getting paid. Uh, and mm. some of the politics that are involved within within Fiji. You know, if you could fix Fiji rugby with the wave of Harry Potter's wand, um, what would you do? I, I would I would say just improve the, and, and it's a wider economic thing, I guess, isn't it? You know that these these players are just happy and playing. They love the game. Um, I, I I would just like to see um, players looked after far more financially as well as like advisory around that as well um, to ensure that their families are far more well looked after and that they get educated far more around like what things to do with their money as well and not like at the end of the playing days uh, coming back from France say for example all the money's gone and um, I think just far more support around that and I think you know the uh, the Pacific uh, Players Association are doing some outstanding work around that as well. So you know, yeah. um, but it's it's slow time, isn't it? You know, it's it's um, it's going to take some time to sort of catch up with other um, nations, and I, I just think uh, it ju just far more money for those players for the game that they play, you know, and uh, just to be on a level playing field as far as that is concerned. And then you can argue whether or not that will have an effect upon upon the players themselves, isn't it, you know? Um, who knows? Who knows? But it would just be nice to see that in place, you know, um, as far as salaries are concerned. Now it's time to get into the real crux of tonight's questioning. Um, and Chris, you have been involved in rugby all over the world, uh, including Wales. Now, not a lot in Wales, you... man. But <laughs> <laughs> have you never played rugby in Wales, man? Oh, of course, I played rugby in Wales, but like there we go. As as, uh, there yeah, yeah. we go. As far no, as no, coaching, mate, Welsh. it's no, not no, as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they wouldn't. Um, <laughs> so, what we want to know is the best practical joke you've ever been involved with. Or seen within rugby, no matter where you were. Practical joke. Ooh. Talk about putting someone on the spot, right? Um, I, I, I think um, the old like. It, it's You've got to have a couple a of stories, and now you're filtering those stories to decide which one. No, no, you can I know, say, I know, I know which, which one, one I got. I know which one I got. First one that sprung to mind, and I think it's always important to go with your gut feeling first. And that was, um, I think this has been done loads of places. 
um, where hotel room has been um, like turned upside mm. down, items, desks, stuff like that, taped to ceiling, or items removed outside, representing that room directly outside the room on the ground floor. Uh, that's that been sounds done like an air cadet camp to me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think... It's it's one of those things, I, or a lot of those things that are missing. Maybe potentially that I miss quite a lot. I guess um, in particular, transition amateur to pro high performance. You, you haven't got fucking time to do stuff like that, you know. And it's just the general chat conversations and the piss taking that sort of overtake those practical sort of uh, joking, isn't it? I think. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah, the best I, I can come out with at the moment. It's probably shit, isn't it? Um, but I think it's really hard for the Sevens team. I, I do, because they're not based locally. They're bought from all over a country, whether that country be small or large. Um, and as soon as it's finished, you, you have a night on the beer, and then you're gone. You go back home. Um, so things like that are always very difficult. Now, we're going to take a very, very quick break. But uh, when we come back, we're going to start talking tonight's rumour mill. We'll see you straight after this. Welcome back to part four of the 22 dropouts tonight. Uh, we are joined by Chris Davis, uh, who, ha well, we could say where he's from, but we haven't got that long uh, because he's been from everywhere. And because he's Welsh as well, he probably came from a village with a name that nobody else can pronounce other than himself. Um, now, uh, before the break, we asked Tom some very, very difficult questions about, uh, about rugby. Tom's serious questions, didn't we? You yeah, said Chris Tom. Like this is why you never make an offer, so he keeps on interrupting every single introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He needs to learn his place, doesn't he, Chris? Can, I can you imagine him on briefings? In, he should go in as an oik, get beasted for 13 weeks. By the time he's finished that beasting, then he goes over to Cromwell to do his sergeant course because he's gone direct entry sergeant. At which point he is now thinking he's big I am because I'm going direct entry against all these officer cadets. By the end of that time, then he'll be put in his place. And he'll spend two years as a sergeant before he realises, fuck this, I've got to go to Cranwell. He'll put in his papers to go to Cranwell. He'll get a place without a shadow of a doubt. And then he can become a twat after that. Yeah, the twat's you know, just brewing strange. inside him. The, the twat has been brewing inside him for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Good job his sister's a lot nicer, isn't it? <laughs> well, we she's a lot more clever. Do you know what? She won't fuck up her A levels either. <laughs> That's because she's not. She's doing a diploma. She's not doing A levels. She's doing. Do you see what I mean? Thing. Do you see what Chris means about interrupting and and trying to be one better? No, just take it the fact that she's. Right, anyway, amazing. let's crack on. Let's not have a family feud. Christopher. Yes, Christopher. Just face it. She's better than you. I'm aware. I'm okay. well aware. Just, well, why can't you be more like your sister? <laughs> is that what your mum says? That's what you say. No, no, I don't want you to be like your sister. I would have nobody to take the piss out of. <laughs> Welcome back to part four of your favourite... <laughs> Are you tuning into Chris? Sure. <laughs> Welcome back to part four of your favourite YouTube show and podcast. Now, before the break, we asked... Chris is fine. Uh, the really difficult questions about uh, being in Fiji would be... Uh, and he was unable to answer most of them uh, without um, the presence of a lawyer. Anyway, but we are going to ask him straight away because it's time for this week's Rumour Mill. Rumour Mill. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> you make yourself look every week. And I don't care. And that's the difference between you and me. I'm not about image and personality because I've got one and you haven't. Mike, um, do, do you know what really so, springs to mind with Christopher? Listen to respond, not listening to understand. 
<laughs> now that's straight out of the management textbook. <laughs> uh, oh, look, he's gone quiet. <laughs> Oh, right. no, okay. uh, listen, five, final 10 minutes of the show, so definitely time for the rumour mill. And first of all, because we always put our special guest on the spot, Chris, what's the best thing you've heard about rugby or in rugby this week? The RFU's decision to scrap England Sevens is all just a bit of a, let's get the feelers out there. And I think I've heard that there's going to be a big buyer coming in and just saving the programme. And also on See, that, he has watched last week's show. He watched our show. He knows we've got a buyer for England Sevens. <laughs> and on top of that, as part of the contract agreement, that uh, Premiership sides will work with the buyer. You will contract those players within the Premiership to allow transition between both games. <laughs> now you see, this is what rumours are made of. It's called. Bullshit. But if you say it in a really convincing way, and Chris, there's a little bit of work needed there. But that's a good, good start. Good start on day 10. When you come back on the show next time, just just try, try a little harder. Uh, oh, I could. I in, could, other words, I could. in other words, Chris hasn't got a bloody thing. No. Which is fair enough, but it's nice try. It's interesting, though. Nice try. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, it's, hey, what, it's what's required. Hey, it? It's what's required. Yeah. We, we talked about it on last week's show. We know it can be done with private equity. Will the RFU, England Rugby, whatever you want to call them, will they relinquish control in order to get private equity in to fund the entire programme? Who will take control of the programme if there's private money coming in? And that's the problem, I think, isn't it? So, hashtag, you heard it here first. We can do it, Speaking but the RFU probably don't want seven. us to. Tom Reed, Tom Reed, your rumour. Because I'm bored of my... My rumour. My, Tom, Tom, well, Reed, my Tom Reed. Did he just become the host of the show without telling anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and he's got bored of you talking. I'm trying to move things along. You're the one who said we only had 10 minutes back. Says the man talking. Tom, Tom Reed, off first. you go. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so a bit of a link there <laughs> from, from Chris's uh, sort of rumour. Initially was a rumour and confirmed this very evening that Dan Norton is going to London Irish um, to play in this season's premiership. Ah, well, there you On go. On a short-term there's deal. A room, there's, a, there's a rumour that's come true. Lawrence, I'm going to come to Kenya <laughs> now because uh, at least I might get some fucking sense, uh, which I don't get from these two twats. <laughs> Love you, Tom. It's all right. We can say twat. We <laughs> just can't say... <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we are. There we well, at least, uh, at least something else doesn't happen tonight. Bring, bring uh, some order to the, bring some order to the rumor mill. Come on, Lawrence, yeah. tell us what you got, man. A Premiership club uh, is under investigation for potentially breaching the salary cap. The rumors are the club uh, is on the verge of finishing uh, top four in the current uh, in the ongoing season. So, back to you, Lawrence, in the studio. Because <laughs> uh, I think it cannot be uh, Saracen this time. <laughs> but uh, who is I'm it? looking who at is the it? log now, mm. number one is. <laughs> I'm actually looking at the log. Number mm. one is extra, two is sell. Three Bristol and four us. So if if I'm right on that, you are. That's mm. right. I wonder who's so, got a load of really yeah. good players from Let other think, clubs and around the three world. Players. Three players. Not three. Harlequins, Tom. <laughs> Not Harlequins, no. <laughs> <laughs> three who's got three marquee players alone in this one transfer window? Chris, <laughs> Michael, you do realise what a marquee player is and that each team can only have two. So you can't say they've got three marquee. They may be very, very good. Don't get me wrong. They may three, deserve to be marquee. They've got at least three no. players on marquee no. player contracts, though. No, they haven't because the, the regulations state they can only have two. Yeah, but have you not seen oh. how much they're on? It, no, marquee is not about the money. It's about the status and they're allowed to put two on that programme. If you're going to talk bullshit, to talk half decent bullshit, I hate you. I know. I do understand his point, though. They've got three insanely good players, which would they have. at any other club probably be Absolutely. a marquee player. Which Absolutely. is yeah. we're talking Bristol, the, aren't we? 
No. I mean, I didn't say Bristol. I, never, I don't think anyone else said <laughs> No, that. nobody said Bristol. That's my fucking point. Listen, we don't exist to pussyfoot around. We're referees. We tell it like it is. It seems like Bristol might be investigated, and we have talked about this before, and so have loads of other players uh, and, and podcasts saying, where are they getting the money from? We don't know. The last interview I heard with the DOR was that I've seen the books. I know we're well under. So I think that's one that we're going to park and, and let's wait and see. Uh, Chris, you've got something about SIPs. I do. There are rumours that Sippers could be leaving his contract at Gloucester a year early. There are rumblings. He's I, have, on his I have those to, after a curry. There are, there, there are rumblings in the rugby world that he's on his way to Japan. To be honest, I thought that might have happened a year or two ago. Yeah, well, yeah. Absolutely. The article in front of me says that they're offering the playmaker in the region of one million pounds a season. So you're on rook.co.uk tonight, aren't you? I can tell. Never heard of it. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. Um, can um, I also say though that, that today, today Sips did get engaged as well, so we'd have to drag his yeah, current fiance out there as well. Did he really? Oh, for, uh, well congratulations, Sips. For getting engaged. Congratulations, Sips. Right, that's enough now. Now, before we go, there is some news that's probably going to come out next week. And because of that, I don't want to talk too much about it. Not because I don't want to. I don't want to put some people in a difficult situation. But there are, there, is, there are going to be developments within the refereeing, within the RFU. And those developments are going to be confirmed, hopefully, next week. Uh, and this goes from the top downwards. Um, with some very, very major changes to the PGMOT. Um, but mm-hmm. because they are still in consultation at the moment, I don't want to go into too many uh, details. So, uh, look, to everybody and to all our friends, because we've all got some who have been on the community teams, um, to our incredibly good friend, Julian, who uh, we're helping at the moment. And hopefully he will find uh, new employment, uh, in the, again, in the sport he loves, hopefully very very soon and we're going to do everything that we can and um, you know for all of those guys that, that know us we're we're all thinking of you um it, it's a tough time and if there's anything that we can do i know we take the piss a lot but if there's anything that we can do just do get in touch um now we have come to the end of the show <laughs> it's been a roller coaster we've had emotional time at the end and all the usual shit in between um, and by the time we edit this down, it'll be about 23 minutes long of all the things we can say. Um, but it has been a pleasure being with you all tonight. Hopefully you will go and check out our back catalogue as well. Don't forget to listen to us when you're travelling to work or you're on an easy jet flight. Do check out as well our chosen charity at the moment, the Doddy Weir Foundation. Don't forget to check out uh, the Doddy Weir Foundation as well. www. Uh, my name and then the figure five doddy.co.uk now something that has uh, happened uh, over this weekend i'm sure you'll be aware is the rugby against cancer walk uh, if it, you can support them that would be really good just search uh, hashtag rugby against cancer you'll find them on all of the social media channels as well we've been supporting them we hope you will too now we have reached the end of tonight's show um it's been absolutely great welcoming chris uh, and uh, uh, and Lauren's back as well. So, uh, guys, from me, from the 22, from Chris Will Do, uh, and we'd love to see you again, Chris. It's good night from me. It's good night from everybody else. Good night, guys. Take care. Bye, guys. See you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.